Lots of heavy-duty praying for me. Usually I don't get that much into it, but uh, okay. Here it is. We're back into blood covenant. The fortitude of commitment. And we are going to, just like I said I was going to, is we're going to do marriage number four. Marriage number four. Now we are, yeah, believe it or not, we've had, this is our fourth covenant marriage message. So there. Where have you been? It's scary when your wife goes, huh? Okay. <laughs> well, here's the deal. All disclaimers apply this morning. I am going to finalize what I started last time. And I'm, I'm trying my hardest. Here's, here's the deal. When I taught last time about divorce and remarriage, I'd only taught a little bit. Okay, and I actually taught quite a bit, but I hadn't finished because there's too much. There's just way too much. So that's what I'm finishing on this morning, but I want you to hear me. Please listen. Uh, I seem to have stirred the pot rather severely, which to me is what? How do I know the difference? <laughs> that seems to be a normal place of existence for me, okay? But more than usual, okay? And again, please hear me. I'm giving the disclaimers as best as I possibly can, and I'll probably give it 95 more times in the middle of this message. I am not being mean about this. I'm, tell, I'm not, this is an emotional thing for people, and once you start teaching what the Word of God says, then people start getting really cranky in this area. I am not trying to condemn anybody, and you will not hear condemnation coming from me. But if I do not teach the entire counsel of God, if there's something that I'm not going to teach on, then I quit now. Because I have got to do the entire counsel of God. So, with that said, we jump in. Okay. Mellage. Mellage is what brings us together today. It's amazing how many people are quoting that with me. That's really sad. <laughs> Okay, we're still talking about marriage. Okay, God invented it. And this first part is just review. God invented it to bring two into one. We have the covenant of marriage to show us the covenant between Jesus and the church. And remember, this, this series is on covenant. This isn't on marriage, this is on covenant. Okay, but the best description we have for covenant in the scripture, in this pro present day culture is marriage it's the about the only one now i can bring up the military and we did bring up the military okay that's a good picture of the covenant to a degree okay but there is nothing like marriage to show the covenant and that's why we get into trouble okay it shows spiritual intimacy and natural intimacy now we've talked about this this is a this is a big deal is that there is a correlation in scripture between sex and worship Say, you're kidding. No. God gave us physical intimacy so we may understand a better grip on what so spiritual intimacy is all about. You say, well, that sounds really kinky. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't write the Bible. I'm also the one that did not call Israel an adulterous nation whenever they worshipped another god. God did. He called them adulterers, not idolaters. He made the difference. Why? Because there's a correlation between covenant in marriage and covenant with our Lord, and he said he was marrying Israel, and he was with them. Now, what we're going to get into today is kind of a tricky thing, is when do you break covenant? When is covenant broken? That gets kind of tricky, doesn't it? Maybe I should have you start the Jeep and get it really just started right here. Okay, here we go. Marriage is giving on behalf of the other. That's the truth, but that's not the way we've done it. We get married for ourselves. Okay? Uh, how many guys have I known? I even had one guy I knew had written out his vows, and in his vows, he wanted her to, to commit to cooking his breakfast. I didn't have a lot of hope for his marriage. Okay? What was he trying to do? A contract to make her serve him. Why was he getting married? For her to serve him. That's not the reason we get married. 
Well, that might be the reason you did get married, but that's not the reason we're supposed to be getting married, okay? We're supposed to be getting married for a reason of serving the other one. Boy, that's tough, isn't it? Because it's... <laughs> As soon as we get into this, well, you haven't done what you were supposed to do to me. You are not talking covenant anymore. You're talking contract. And that's not what the Bible's talking about. Home first and then outward. It must be in the home before we can have ministry going out other places. I'm going real fast because this is a review. Marriage is the most blessed relationship. It's the one on the planet that God made and it's the first relationship he did make. He brought Adam and Eve together. It's the blessed relationship. Is it powerful? Yes. Wonderful. It's the deepest emotional relationship. It's the one that has the most... That's why when you start getting problems in a marriage, it gets goes south quick. Because there's a lot of emotions involved. Whew, boy, is there a lot of emotions. When there are problems, wow, very difficult. There we go. Sir. Oh, yeah. Does it go deeper than David and Jonathan? I would say yes. Okay. Is there an out? Now, therein lies our trouble. Okay. You behave yourself. I'll have my wife sit next to you. Rick. Well, she says she's not going to. <laughs> so, he has his wife. Okay, Sandy. Keep him in line. Sharpen your elbow. You need a whetstone here? You'd be bleeding by the end of the service. Okay. Is there an out? That's the question. The question. That is the question. People ask me this on the all the time. All the time. The problem is, as soon as you start asking the question, you're already in trouble. Is there an out? Why would you want out? Okay? Why would you want out? The problem is, this thing is much more serious than we think. We think, oh, it's just a guy and a gal, and they just want to get together, and they want to have the tax benefits. Are there tax benefits? <laughs> okay. Not that you've ever found. <laughs> no. uh, <laughs> cash flow is cash flow. Yeah, and all my, my cash flows to her, so that's the way that cash flow works. Okay. It's more serious than we first think. If we think of a quick in, then we want a quick out. And here is the problem, is we've gotten such a lax idea about marriage that we have a lax idea about how they should stay. This is why I've been teaching on covenant. Now, I don't want to give a, a quick out. No such thing as a quick out to me. Okay, but in culture, in the Jewish culture, was there a quick out? At different periods in time, yes. Under different rabbis. Okay, and I've got the resource down. I can read you all the stuff. Uh, where the different names of the different rabbis that said what and where. But under certain rabbis, you could, you could divorce your wife for her burning your breakfast. Made that, made that in the covenant. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you didn't say how to cook it. You know, hey, so there's no stipulations. Yeah, I feel like we're in parts of the Caribbean. You didn't determine what parts of it, you know. Okay. Quick in makes for quick out. Well, I don't even do quick ends. When people come to me for marriage counseling, they for pre to get married for premarital counseling, I they want what they want is a meeting to work out all the problems of the service, have the service, get them hitched and out the door. And they look at you, you should see the looks on their faces when I say I require twelve hours of premarital counseling that has nothing to do with the service. And go, what? What is wrong with you? Twelve? I'm being very lenient at twelve. Okay? Have I ever had times when we're sitting there bored in our twelve hours? No. Have we had more than twelve hours? Yeah. Why? Because no quick in. I don't marry people quickly. Well, why, Lee? They love each other. <laughs> I'll be the judge of that. And you say, you will? Oh, absolutely. Because if it's true love and it's really godly love, then it'll show up. And I'll tell you, all this emotional stuff shows up in the middle of my counseling sessions. I bet you believe that, don't you? 
premarital counseling, I'll stir the pot best I can. I'll try my hardest to get them all cranked up. Why? I want to know what they're made of. I want to show them what love really is, and love is not a warm, fuzzy feeling. And if you need to have a warm, fuzzy feeling to know if you're in love, you got a problem. Do I hear an amen from somebody? I'll pay you. Amen. Just say, you get okay. Baby, dinner is on me. All right. Keep up the amens or else it's just McDonald's. Okay. See, however many, many amens there are determines where we're going. Okay. She's going, amen, 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 amen. Manipulative, I tell you. Why did God invent marriage? Of all the stupid things in the world, God invented marriage for what reason? Why would he do this to us? Man, it's very simple. What was that? Torture? Apparently he's not going to dinner with us. Apparently not. <laughs> apparently not. He's not going home either. <laughs> Back to marriage. <laughs> okay. Aren't they in marriage for life? <laughs> Okay, why did God invent marriage and it's not for torture? He invented marriage, it says in Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll be looking at that in minute detail again. He invented marriage to give us understanding of the relationship between Jesus and the church. Therefore, it's a huge, huge thing. There's spiritual implications in a marriage. Is God uncaring for people's emotions? This is the other thing. People will be having a rough marriage, and they come to me and say, I want to get a divorce. And I said, no. They said, you just don't understand. You just don't love me. You don't care for me. God doesn't care about my emotions. If he wants me to stay in this, you should see this. What he does to me, it's horrible. It's so hurting. Yeah, I get put on that kind of pressure, that kind of emotional pressure on a fairly regular basis. You should see what happens in my office when people come in. And they come in the last dregs of possibility of keeping their marriage together. They don't come in when the problem first happens or when they start to deal. No, they have to wait until it's Attila the Hun and Adolf Hitler together, you know. And they come in trying to get things in men, and it's, it's out the roof. And they're expecting me to calm everybody down long enough to think. I get that kind of emotional pressure. Doesn't God care about my emotions? Yes, he does. Get that in your head, okay? Yes, he cares. Yes, I care. But I'm not going to be manipulated emotionally into doing something that's unscriptural that's going to damage you. I'm going to make sure that it's as godly and as scriptural as possible. And I am going to make sure there's emotional healing for every person involved. To the best of my ability in Jesus Christ. Okay? When I see one of these situations, I know what kind of warfare I'm getting in for. That's not the time I put on my armor. I sleep in my armor. Okay? I know what's going on. First walk in the door, I'm ready. I'm ready. Why? Because I'm not the warrior. I'm just the sword that the Lord carries. So I'm ready. Does God care about peace of the moment? Yes. Am I caring about people's emotions? Yes, I am. But there's more compassion than is understood. I want to see healing. I want to see it done right. I want to see the person, every single person, walk before God with absolute total healing involved. Amen. No quick outs. Why? Quick outs just exacerbate it and keep the things going forever. Because I keep talking to people who've been divorced, and all I have to do is bring up their ex, and the emotions go... <laughs> and you say, have you forgiven them? Oh, yeah, I've forgiven that scum-sucking pig. I chose to. And I'm going, whoa, you didn't forgive, but you did get some religion going. You want to get rid of that? Okay. No, true compassion. First things first. I don't even talk about divorce. I don't even talk about it at the beginning. Why? That's not the issue. There's a reason they want a divorce. What happened? Who's hurt? Who's doing what? Where are they going with this thing? What's going on? Who's made what actions? He committed adultery against me. Cool. That's cool. Why? What do you mean, why? I thought that was a very good question. Why did he commit adultery against you? You don't know? Man, we've got a lot of work to do before we ever get to the point 
I'm trying to figure out if there should be a divorce here or not. Why did he commit adultery? And I have seen guys who were forced into adulterous situations by a nagging, mean, vicious, horrible witch at home. You say, did you actually say that? I didn't say B. I used a W. It was witch, okay? But I've seen it. Forced out. Man, horrible emotions at home. They go out. What do they do? Find comfort in the arms of another woman. And then she says, you committed adultery against me. Yeah. Okay? Is it possible that it's the woman's fault sometimes? Absolutely. Is it possible the woman could have an adulterous affair? Absolutely. Question. Why? What do you mean, why? There's something wrong here. Let's find out why. Let's get things taken care of so they don't have to go there again. What a concept. Let's bring this whole thing into view of the Lord Jesus Christ. Before you start talking about divorce and remarriage, let's first talk about healing. Let's talk about being real Christians. Let's talk about really examining things. And the problem is, and I want to put this out here, because this, this is going to go out to people, this CD set, this little mini-series on covenant marriage. Don't wait until it's a disaster to get help. Amen. Now listen, and I'm going to talk to the men because men are stupid. <laughs> listen to me. Amen. Amen. There you go. Oh, him lunch. No. <laughs> Definitely. Now listen, men will say, yeah, I've got a problem, but I can handle it. I'm going to tough it out. It's all okay. I don't, I'm just okay. I'm tough. I can just be, yes, yes. Well, if you just change that woman, if you just like this, men will not look for help. It's true. Okay? Men do not want to be examined. They do not want to come into a counseling kind of situation and sit there and find out how stupid they've been. They know how stupid they've been. Really, I'm not kidding. They know, and it's not easy. And they don't want anybody else examining and making them feel bad. Listen, guys, swallow the pride. Get some help. The evidence for that is who comes into your office. Yeah, I get them after the damage. Yeah, and I get, I get a whole bunch more women than do men. Now, let me ask Randall. How are you? How's it going? <laughs> Lunch is going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we're still friends after this, okay. <laughs> did you come into my office? I did. Recently? Yes. Was it fun? Totally. After was fun. What? Before you came in, was it no. fun? Thinking about it? No. Was it tough? Yeah. Did you struggle? Yeah. Did your wife have to drag you into my office? Uh, Pretty much? Verbally, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense, doesn't it? Are you glad you came in? Totally. <laughs> now, if I said, ooh, we found something else, would you want to come into my office? Yes, I would. Do, would you have to be dragged in by your wife? No, probably not. Probably there may not. still be a little stupidity there, yeah. but yeah, probably not. But what kept you from wanting to come in? Exposure. Exposure. Guys, this is normal. This is the way it is. I could, do, I could just go back one row. Joe, are you glad you came in? I found him sitting in the car one time just deciding if I was coming. Then. Yeah. <laughs> he, was, he was out there debating, fighting with himself. I ain't going, yes, you are, no, you're not. No. He just came out and said, let me just change the discussion. I was expecting him to walk up, and all of a sudden he walks up, are you coming in? He's just going to sit there. <laughs> well, okay. Are you glad you came in? Yeah. Did it work? Oh, yeah. Now, this last time, I, I drug you in because I needed a guinea pig. Yeah. Are you glad I drug you in? It was scary. It was scary. But you're a tough man. You made it. Now. Help me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> listen, listen to this. Are you glad he came in? Yeah, absolutely. Are you glad he came in? Oh, absolutely. Did it help your marriage? 100%. 110%. Oh, oh her lunch? Boy, this is becoming a very expensive message. I'll tell you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, go call Subway. Dragging in here. Okay. But first things first, folks, listen, think. If it's going downhill, another month is not going to make it better. Right. Downhill is downhill, okay? Think about it, guys and gals. 
Is it exposure? Yes. Do you, do you have to actually confess stuff in front of somebody? Yes. Are they going to examine your life? Yes. Is it going to be exposing? Yes. Is it comfortable? No. Is it tough? Yes. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Don't sit on your butt longer than you need to. Get some touch with somebody. And it doesn't have to be Lee Eddy. Okay? But let's get together. Man, if, you, if it's not working, it's not working. There's got to be something else. Now, listen, I took my Jeep into a mechanic this last week. You know why? It wasn't working. I couldn't. I didn't know how. Man, this thing was driving me nuts. No inside lights and no rear windshield wiper. And with all the snow and all the junk, this back thing was really getting annoying. No. Put in a fuse three hours later. So that means there's a direct short somewhere, and I'm not going to tear that whole thing apart to find it. Eric knows about that, though. Yeah, Eric knows all there is to know about this now, huh? Did you find it? Oh, what a stud. Okay? He had problems with his truck. Everything was, and then the whole thing would come back on and smell smoke and good stuff. But I took it to a mechanic. You know why? I couldn't fix it. I needed help. Did anybody think less of me by taking it to a mechanic? Yeah. Only Joe. <laughs> Anyone know something? I'm dang secure in who I am. I don't give a flying flapjack, so just there. Okay. First things first. Let's get things straightened out. Where is God in this relationship? Yes, sir? A primary what? Yes. It doesn't matter what the area is. No. So this is yes, you've got to expose things so they can be healed. Okay? That's really true. And listen, I've had wounds that got infected. You know what doctors do with those? Mm-hmm. You know, and there's nobody that says, Oh, great, I get to have my wound cut open and scraped today. If they do, then there's something else wrong. I, I, I bought it. You know what it means when you're riding your bike and you buy it? Okay? Went up into the 7-Eleven parking lot, and the front wheel got deflected by the driveway instead of going up on it. and went, Phew, and I was cooking. Bike went that way. Body went this way. Natural response. No skin left on the palm of my hand. I sat in this. Well, we didn't have money to go to a hospital, but went anyway. I sat in there, and this guy says, um, "So, how's your pain tolerance?" I was right now just asking that. Just dropped it. <laughs> right there. I, I'm a weenie. Why? <laughs> You know, and that's not really true. I, I can take it pretty good, but he says, he says, because this is going to really hurt. <laughs> oh, thank you. So he put my arm under his arm, and then he grabbed my fingers with his hand and bent them down like this. Now, this is how my arm was under his arm, and he's holding it back like this, and he sprays. <laughs> no, no, the, um, the, oh, I'll send you the, it just left. The stuff that Ann, the, yeah, betadine, like this, and took a brush and said, grit your teeth. Now he said, this is his bedside manner. How's your pain tolerance? Grit your teeth, here it comes. Kind of like this, and he scrubbed that palm with a brush until he got all the dirt out. And he says, there, how's that? How's that? I'm going to take your bottom lip and wrap it around the top of your head. Just, mm, Okay. More of that hurt. Guess what? If you hadn't have done it, that's tough love. If you hadn't have done it, I'd have lost my hand. Boy, that was tough love too. I had to keep thinking, this is tough love, this is tough love. Wait till he sees the tough love I give to him after I'm done. Okay. Why is that person acting the way they are? There's got to be a reason. Let's find out. Now, the other question, did they hurt you? Well, yeah, that's the whole reason we're having the discussion. They hurt me. Yeah. Did they, you know, did this other person in your marriage, did they hurt you? Well, what are you supposed to do with hurts 
in the Scripture. Why does it have to be something that... Why is that hard to figure? Very simple. What do you do with hurts? You take it to the Lord Jesus Christ and you get your own healing and you forgive that person and you love them. Now, have we been through that before? That has nothing to do with marriage. It has just to do with being a Christian. Have they become your enemy? <laughs> that, yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, how are we supposed to respond to an enemy? Sure. Bible says, yeah, oh, there we go. There's the Christian response. <laughs> the Bible says, love your enemies. Anybody find that easy? No. Well, where's those hands that I saw before? Joe, come on, Mr. Tough. Okay. Now, is, it, is it easy to love your enemy? No. But if my wife becomes my enemy, I still have two commands, three commands, to love her. Husbands, love your wives, love your enemies, and love one another. In case you wanted more than one witness, according to Scripture. Woo. Now, does anybody here want to get into how to love? There's a series in that. Amen. First things first. Let's do them first. Okay. By the time people want it out, there's already been several judgments made. Yeah. Amen. Huh? Yeah. Because this scumbag did this to me. Do you think there's a judgment in that? Are we supposed to judge? What are we supposed to do with judgments? Forgive them. Turn them over to the Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you, folks, first things first. There's so much more that needs to be done before we can ever get to the point of deciding if this is a bad marriage or not. Wow. Is there sin being done in both directions? Absolutely. You said, well, you haven't even heard the situation. <laughs> there are two people involved. There's sin involved in both directions. Now, except in our marriage. Okay, it's absolutely. <laughs> See, that was close to sin right there. See, that's uh, okay. Both directions, okay. Now, here we go. Did that person commit adultery against you? Oh, yeah. Did I ever commit adultery against my wife? Let's see. Two decades of pornography, and every time you lust after a woman in the heart, it's considered adultery. Two decades worth of everyday, multiple adulteries. Should she have divorced me? No. Praise God. It has nothing to do with my adultery. But now you know how God feels. Because every time we worship something other than God, it's committing adultery against Him. Isn't it? You ever think about it that way? Wow. Every time I worship myself, every time I want what I want, and I don't care what anybody else says, every time I'm thinking about just me and I'm being all selfish, that's self-worship. That's adultery against God. Okay? Is my committing adultery less than theirs committing adultery? And this is the problem. Okay? Let's say we know, according to Scripture, that if you divorce somebody and marry another, it commits adultery. And we went over those Scriptures in Matthew and Mark and Luke and in Romans chapter 7. If somebody divorces a wife, leaves her, he commits adultery against her. If she gets married, she commits adultery. So here's a, here's a scenario. A couple comes in and she says, he committed adultery against me. I'm going to divorce him because there's an adulteress out. I say, okay. So she divorces him. Then she gets remarried to this wonderful Christian man. What was the difference between his adultery and her adultery? None. None. Except for one is clothed in the righteous package of religion. One is acceptable adultery, and one is not. Kind of a hard problem, isn't it? It's a real problem for me. Am I going to allow somebody to divorce and remarry? Not if there's a shred of hope in any way, shape, or form. And not from their point of view. Because from their point of view, it's hopeless anyway. My point of view. When I get to the point where there's absolutely no shred of hope, then maybe we'll talk about it. But you're going to have to work hard to get me to that point aren't you? I'm a little bit tenacious. My wife's been working on this. I've been such a weenie all my life that she's working on my being a little bit more stubborn. Oh, no, steadfast. Steadfast. I'm not stubborn. 
steadfast. Amen. Okay. Long-term emotional battles. Will there be long-term emotional battles? Yes. Can they handle it? Is there ever a godly reason for divorce? Yes. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. <laughs> yes, there is. Have I ever counseled anybody to get a divorce? Righteously. Yes. <laughs> I ought to stir the pot a little bit. I know a woman who was coerced into marrying a guy in prison. By the family, his family, coerced her into marrying him. And it was all a legal ploy to give him some credence so he could get a parole and do stuff so she could bring stuff into him. And it was all a manipulative. It was never consummated. It was never anything. He was in prison. They signed these papers, and she was legally married to that man. And I said, divorce him. Legally. Righteously. Absolutely. Annulled. Okay? That was just, that was not right. That was, a, that was not a true commitment on her part, by the way. That was not a good covenant in any way, shape, or form. That was bad news. Did I do that? Yes, I did. Okay. But, have you fulfilled all the scriptural injunctions before you get there? Okay? What are you going to do? If somebody will do all that the scripture says about it and walk in total holiness, we'll go for divorce. But the problem is they won't want a divorce if they do it all because they'll end up loving the other. Is there cause in scripture for separation? We'll talk about that in a second. Let's give God access to the whole thing. Can we actually change another person? The Bible says, how do you know, husband, if you're going to save your wife? And how do you know, wife, if you're going to save your husband? Right? The Bible says that, doesn't it? Oh. Yeah. Can we change another person? Absolutely. In a covenant. Uh, doesn't mean I can change them after uh, I'll go marry an unbeliever and then change them. No, no. In order. But if somebody gets born again and their, their husband and wife is still unsaved, oi, can we change them? Yes. Why? Because God is into this. And man, there's covenant prayers and there's all sorts of different things to do over this man. Laying hands on him. Man, I have seen all oh, the stories. The stories I could tell you. The things we've seen. Okay? I'll tell you, I had, I had 300 women sitting on the edge of their chairs sucking up every single word I said. Actually, every single word Maxim said because he was my interpreter. Okay? In a Russian, in a church in the Ukraine, 300 women showed up for a Wednesday night service thousand member church or so, Wednesday night service, there must have been five or six men in that room, and that's about it. 300 women. And I looked at them, and I had a message all prepared, and I went, click, and the Lord's saying, here's your shot, take it. All right. So I taught them how to pray for an unsaved husband. Boy, did I get in trouble. Whew. But it was worth it. <laughs> okay. Are you willing to do the fight to change that other person? Let me tell you a little story. There was a woman we knew whose husband was a dope-dealing, gun-toting, long-haired, bike-riding, hippie freak that happened to be an excellent carpenter. Okay? Sexually addicted. Kind of a weird guy. Well, she got born again. <laughs> After they were married. Oh, this is, yeah, they got kids and everything going, man. She decided, hmm, I'm going to stick with this guy and I'm going to, I'm going to just stand. I'm going to pray for him. And she learned how to intercede. She learned how to pray. Okay? Their son and daughter were growing up and all of a sudden in their church one day, the kid wanted to be part of Royal Rangers. Royal Rangers, it's a Christian Boy Scout kind of a thing. Okay? And uh, they needed help. Well, they always encouraged the fathers to come out, and so they encouraged this father to come out with his child to the Royal Rangers thing. He sat out there in the Royal Rangers thing. Well, it's camping. This, this guy's attention. It's camping, hunting, fishing, doing all this fun stuff, and oh, 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 man stuff. So he got out there, and he got to hang with him. And all of a sudden, these kids are asking him questions about his life and why he lived the way he did. There's nothing like a 10-year-old 
asking a real question about why you do stuff. Why do you carry a gun? Because, um, because a drug deal might go bad. How do you tell a kid that? What's a drug deal? Um, it got really dicey. It pushed him, and he finally examined his life and got born again. Seven years she fought for him. Seven years she put up with all his junk. Seven years. I know, it's the amount of completion. She about had it, too. <laughs> it was about complete. He didn't change overnight. Well, there's a concept. Anybody else here change completely overnight? We're just like, he's sitting out there one night in a tent, and this 11-year-old kid looks at him and says, Would, may I ask you a question? He says, what's that? He says, why do you smoke? Because it tastes good? This kid just looked at me and he said, that's it. I want to live a life that a kid can examine. That changed his life. When did we meet this couple? We met this couple when we went to candidate school for being missionaries. And you know what he wanted to do? He wanted to take Royal Rangers into Russia. And he did. And we met with them. We lived with them. I mean, they were our closest friends in Russia for five years. We were very, very close to these. these they even moved with us to Latvia. It was really amazing. And they started Royal Rangers in Russia and are still doing it. And she is in charge of intercession and praise and worship for Christ of the Nations Institutes and for different things. Come on. This couple, missionary couple, why did they make it to the field to change people's lives? Because she had the fortitude to fight it out for seven years with a drug-dealing, gun-toting, hippie freak, sex addict. And he's still a strange man. <laughs> it's true. And, and they're going to be here in a couple months, or next month, I think. Haas is Roy and Charlene Haas. Yeah, so there. <laughs> How about them for apples? I just don't tell you all sorts of stuff, huh? <laughs> see, that's why I, I do this, so that you'll come to the messages, see? So that's, see, yeah. Okay, we got a long ways to go. Let's talk about every prophet of God to Israel and Judah. You ever study them? You know what they did? They had a message to Israel, come back to me, come back to me, come back to me, come back to me, come back to me. It shows God's continual effort to bring those that he was in covenant with back to himself. That's almost your entire Old Testament, is God wooing them back, wooing them back, wooing them back. Call him back. Tell him, don't do that. I'll destroy you. <laughs> yeah, that's not one of those sentences you want to say to your wife, by the way. Okay. In a marriage, committed to be used in extraordinary ways. If you're going to fight, boy, committed to be used in extraordinary ways. God, how would you like to be one of those prophets in the Old Testament? Let's be Ezekiel. Okay? No. Don't want to be Ezekiel. <laughs> Read the book. You, you would not believe what God makes this man do. Ugh. Amazing. What is God truly saying to you? See, I like to ask people, what is God truly saying? I had a, a woman this week crying her eyes out in my office and all this sort of stuff, and I said to her, okay, can, you, can you think for a second in your spirit without all your emotions draining you? She says, maybe. I said, just give it a try, okay? I want you to just listen to your spirit. She says, okay. I says, Lord Jesus, would you tell her, is there hope for this marriage? What do you say? And she stopped her emotions long enough to listen to her spirit, and she heard the Lord say, there's much hope for your marriage. What did God say? Let's find out what God said. Okay? Do I condemn divorcees? Teresa? Do I condemn divorcees? Are you a divorcee? Not anymore. Well, yeah, okay. Okay, I thought I'd catch you before you went to the bathroom. Sorry, but I had to get your coat. Okay, get your coat. You want my sweater? I'm starting to really cook here. Okay. I don't condemn people who've been divorced. I, people tell me I do, but they're not listening. Do I condemn? No. 
No, no, no. If you've been divorced, do I love you? Yes. Will I work with you? Yes. Will I let you do anything? Yes. What will I do? I will make sure that there's as much healing as is possible in every situation you've got in your life. Do I condemn divorcees? No. No. Absolutely not. Uh, was, yes. Yeah. I used them very sneaky this last week. Okay. I says, I know a couple. She's been divorced twice. This is her third husband. Each child is from a different husband. And this last one, her husband stole her from her previous husband. And he had an addiction to sexuality. I says, does that sound worse than yours? She goes, this lady in my office said, yeah. Sound a little tougher than what you've got going? Yeah. Well, that woman is sitting out in my reception area right now. <laughs> that was fun. And I says, and her husband's my associate pastor in this church. Is there any condemnation to divorcees? No. But what have I done in every area of their life as long as I've known them? Is try to bring healing to the past. Healing to the past. Deal with this thing. Deal with this thing. Let's talk about it. Let's look at it. I don't want it hanging around in your life. Let's get it out. Has that not been the attitude? That's what we've been shooting for, huh? That's exactly what I'll shoot for with anybody. Let's get it healed. Let's get it dealt with. You want to get a divorce? No. I'm not going to let you go there. We've got a lot of work to do. You hearing my attitude? Are you hearing my attitude? Thank you. First things first. Healing, forgiveness, and repentance. And because of that, I've seen many healings. Okay? I know churches that just, they, they let anybody divorce anybody, and then they let anybody else marry anybody else. And they don't worry about the healings. Guess what? It runs rampant in their church. Okay? You want to know the worst thing that can happen? Worst thing that can happen is a man can, will divorce a woman, marry a younger wife in the church, and their marriage looks awesome. The absolute worst thing that can happen in church. Because then everybody says, well, I can get rid of this bag and marry me a good one. <laughs> or the other way around. Same thing. You get a divorce and a remarriage that looks really good. What does that do? Oh, man, that just, that just brings divorce, runs rampant through the church. Causes all sorts of disunity in all sorts of marriages. It's a probably one of the worst things that could happen is a good one. Okay? That's tough. Okay. I've seen many healings. Now, here's where I get in trouble. I'm going to real, I'm just going to jump in real quick. Okay? First Corinthians chapter 7. I've been looking at this chapter a lot. Okay? Because this is a fun, kind of a strange chapter, and I don't have it written out here verse by verse, okay? But I want you to look at it anyway. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, this is one of those ones, can you be dogmatic when Paul says, well, this isn't by command of God, this is just my opinion. Okay? Hear the problem? Trying to be dogmatic in Scripture about is this Paul's opinion or is this the command of God? Okay? Well... If we only dogmatically teach what is God's commands, if we take only what is true commands out of this passage, you're going to see a problem here. Okay? Let's break it down. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. Now, this is kind of fun. This is, for those of you who do biblical research, this is, this is one of those laws of hermeneutics that's kind of, kind of a trip. Okay? Sorry, in verse 1 through 9, it says, but concerning what I wrote to what you wrote to me is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, there's a good way to start. Huh? Okay. But because of fornication, let each have his own wife and let each have her own husband. Let the husband give due kindness to the wife and likewise wife to the, to the husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body but the husband. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body but the wife. Do not deprive one another unless by agreement for a time that you may be free for fasting and prayer and come together again on the same place that Satan may not tempt you through your incontinence. God's command or Paul's opinion? What do you think? Well, at the surface, looks like God's command, but look at verse 6. But I say this, by permission, not by command. What? Well, 
No, it doesn't. No, that doesn't make sense at all. No. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. Is that what you're saying? Understood. But here's where we're going from. He says, this is what you wrote for me. This is what you wrote to me. Is it good for a man not to touch a woman? Okay, we can use that as a quote or not. But either way, outside of covenant, is very good for a man not to touch a woman. But in the covenant, changes everything. Okay, but it still says in verse 6, okay, but I say this by permission and not by command. Now, if you start getting into what is in Scripture according to by permission by command, God didn't command him to write that, but gave him permission to write it. If God gave him permission to write it, would it still be scripture? Okay. Now, so this is what we're getting into a real trouble here, is that, is it still scripture? Is it still something we should obey and watch for? Okay. Understand it's by principles. I understand that. Okay. Verse 6 says, um, wow, my page turned, and that just didn't look right. Okay. <laughs> Man, that was scary. Verse 6, which is supposed to say, but I say this by permission, in another chapter says, uh, but brother is judged by brother, and this before unbelievers. Okay, that's just not exactly where I was going with it. Okay, it just didn't make sense. Okay. But verse 7 says, but I desire all men to be as myself, uh, but each has his own gift from God, one this way and another, one another way. But I say to the unmarried men and to the widows, it is good for them if they do remain, also remain as I. But if they do not have them have self-control, let them marry, for it is better for them to be to marry than to be inflamed. Now, isn't that a nasty thing to say? Okay, but I, I just I want everybody to be like me. Okay. Now, evidence is that Paul was married before because he was part of a Sanhedrin, part of a, a body that required people to be married to be part of. Then all of a sudden, you never hear. You've never heard anything. Is his wife dead? Well, I don't know. Did she leave him? I don't know. Did he leave her? I don't know. What do we know? Nothing, except that he was married, and now he's saying, remain as I am, which is not married. Did he get a divorce? Don't know. Don't know anything about it. He doesn't say a word. No evidence at all. But we know at one time he was married, but now he's not. He said, now remain as I am, which is not. Okay? How interesting. Uh, he talks about having sex consistently so that there's not incontinence. You stop for a while to have prayer and fasting, but then get back together and get it on. Amen. Amen there. Okay. That's, that's, that's true. Otherwise, you're having problems. How many people do I know that are sitting there saying, well, we haven't had sex for seven years, and I'm getting a little edgy about it? You think. Okay. Okay. And they're also talking about, well, if you just can't handle it, just get married. Better than to have fornication. Okay. Okay. But he says once you're in marriage, you're there. End of it. But verse 10 and 11 says, But I command the ones being married, not I but the Lord. He commands this. Now watch this. This is a command to those who are married that a woman is not to be separated from her husband. But if indeed she is separated, remain unmarried or be reconciled to the husband. And then he says, And the husband not to leave his wife. Because the same thing from husband's side to wife's side. Doesn't matter. If you're married, stay there. If you leave, Remain unmarried or reconciled. Got your choice. And this, is a command. this is a command. This is not to be danced around. This is not loophole city. This is not, this is straightforward. If you're in a covenant marriage, stay there. Because, and if you separate, then what? Stay unmarried. Now, you should hear what people have accused me of when I bring this up. How dare you assign me a life of loneliness? As if it's my problem, that, they're, that it's my fault that they're going to be lonely for the rest of their life because they're not supposed to marry. Then be reconciled. I don't want to go back to that pig. Then we're still talking about other stuff that needs to be dealt with here. Amen. Are you hearing my heart? Please. Please hear me. 
He uses the commands, and guess what? They're harsh. The commands are harsh. If you take away, this is the only part that is verified in the whole thing that it's the command of God. The rest of it is all what Paul is saying, and the rest of it is all stuff he's saying to kind of, you know, he's dancing around a little bit. But the commands themselves, you want to go straight by commands, it's simple. Stay married. If you don't, stay unmarried. End of discussion. Or be reconciled. Now, nope, okay. What God commands, he empowers fulfillment. Folks, I've got to believe that. God commands us to be married, then he's going to empower us to do this thing. Okay? Amen. Amen. And then 12 through 38, okay, the whole rest of the chapter is about all sorts of funny things. Unbelieving spouses. He says, okay, you have an unbelieving spouse? Simple. If they consent to stay, let them. If they want to leave, let them. Hello. Now, this part kind of bothers me. Why? Because when I hear two Christians saying they want to separate, I keep asking the question, which one of you is the unbeliever? Oh, no, we're both believers. Then what are you doing? Let's figure out why you want to separate, where the emotional damage is. Let's get people healed. Let's get this thing taken care of, and let's get you back to reconciled and healed. Amen. But if you want to leave... Are you the unbeliever? The one who's leaving becomes the unbeliever at that point. Okay, folks, listen. I don't know how else to say this. Is there emotional trauma in these cases? Yes, but listen to me. If there is true physical abuse, get away from them. I believe in that. Emotional abuse, verbal abuse, all forms of abuse, giving captive in your house, giving two, giving fifteen dollars to buy the groceries and everything, and then when you don't get it, the, the abuse. I understand abusive situations. Get away from an abusive situation, okay? And do what? Remain unmarried. Get healed. Let's get healed. Let's get him help. If there's a truly abusive situation, then let's really do something fun. I call the sheriff. Would I do that? Dang straight. Here's the thing. If I find out there's any kind of physical abuse happening to a kid, I am bound by law to call the sheriff. End of discussion. I don't have a choice. Okay, people say, well, come on, give me some leniency. No. So here's my leniency. I'm going to put it out right here. Here's my leniency. Quit doing it before I find out about it. There's my leniency. <laughs> Toast. Toast. Okay? That's it. Shoot, do I believe in, in, in separation? Yes, to keep somebody safe. Permanent? That's not where my heart goes. What my heart goes is let's get healed. Let's get prayer going on this thing. Let's find out what God is doing. Let's turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now, you can't do that. Okay? You can do that. That's really nasty. We've done that. We have done that. We had a woman that was just, she was, she was evil. And he was saying, what do I do? Well, okay, well, let's find out what scripture says. So we turned it over to Satan for the destruction of her flesh. You should have seen what happened to her. Her flesh was destroyed. She looked so bad. God, she looked horrible. And she came in just dragging in going, i got to do something different. This is killing me. Ah, well, that worked. But it's for the saving of the soul. But it's for the saving of the soul. It's not to be mean is mean, but it's not to be mean. I mean, it's not for the purpose of, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah it's not just trying to be nasty to somebody. No, turning somebody over to this better be done with spiritual authority Amen. and in conjunction with what God is saying. Right. Oh, there's another prayer. I like this one. Ever read Hosea? You know, it's in the Bible. God tells Hosea, marry a prostitute. Oh, God. Now, this stirs the pot rather severely, don't you think? So he marries a prostitute. What did he do? He entered into covenant with somebody that was already defiled. Ugh. But, was it really kind of funny? She was an Israeli prostitute. So he was legal to marry her. He didn't marry an unbeliever. He just married a prostitute. I know, I get twisty, doesn't it? And then he has kids by her. 
and names them all sorts of weird things. Just weird. And then she leaves him. She says, I'm going back to my lovers. You're an idiot. So she leaves. She's not happy at home, obviously. So what happens? Hosea chapter 2, we learned a principle in there that is just amazing. It's called praying a hedge of thorns. He prayed a hedge of thorns around her. And you know what happened? All of her lovers lost interest in her and left her alone. She was completely left hanging. And you know what she said? Wow, it's better with that idiot that I'm married to than this. I'm going home. You know what we've done? We've learned how to pray a hedge of thorns over somebody that has problems in those kind of areas. And all of a sudden, all their friends and all their lovers and all these people that helped them out just lose interest in them and leave them alone. And they are left completely alone. That's mean. That's fun. No, that's, that's amazing. Why? Because they come running back going, Oh, God, I wish I'd never left. Got it. You think God is silent about this kind of stuff? No. He has tools that's beyond understanding. Every time somebody's left, every time somebody's left and nobody knows where they are, every time, 100% of the time, you know what I do? And it has never failed. I send out angels. I don't know where we learned how to do that. We did that with looking for kids who would, who would run away from home. We said, Lord, you know where they are. Send out your angels to bring them into a place where somebody finds them. Amen. Corral them. It's like sending out the goon squad or something, you know. You're just going to go get them. Ah, I'm gonna, yeah, the brute squad, yeah. <laughs> We're back to Princess Bride again. You are the brute squad, yes, Okay. <laughs> Okay, there are things to pray. I like praying these things when there's conjunction with what God is saying. And you can really pray some nasty things. It's really, really good. But you better be there to love that person when they fall apart. When you start praying the props out from underneath somebody till all things get exposed, that's the other scripture. I love this one. God, according to Ephesians chapter 5, you said everything that is exposed by the light becomes light. So Lord, we ask you, would you expose it all? Now that's dangerous praying. When he says expose it all, he exposes it all. Including the sin that the other spouse is supposed to be holy has done. He exposes it all. Right. Why do people think that we are useless and helpless and hopeless? And Come on, folks, we've got things we haven't even begun to start to learning how to pray. Okay, But do it in covenant and it really works. Remaining in this, Then he goes on in this chapter about remaining in the state you were called. Hey, were you married when you were called to the Lord? Stay married. When you're unmarried, stay unmarried. That's what he says. He says, and I think I got the Spirit of God on this. He says, but just think about it. Just think about your condition. And he says, and if you're a virgin and you think you want to keep that virginity, that's cool. Hang on to it. That's all cool. But then in verse 39, he says this. That flips over to chapter 6. I don't understand. What is that? Okay. 39. Oh, that's chapter... Where am I now? There we are. 38 says, So that he that gives in marriage does well, but he that does not give in marriage does better. That's his opinion, huh? A wife has been bound by law for as long time as her husband lives, but if her husband sleeps, she is free to be married to whomever she desires only in the Lord. That's the end of the discussion. That's also command. This is scripture. By law. This is what he's saying. A wife is bound by the husband. Now, up above, it says, if, a, if an unbeliever wants to leave, let him. Because uh, a spouse is not bound in that kind of situation. It didn't say you weren't bound in marriage. It just says you're not bound to stay with them. Okay? Understand, scripture has to explain scripture. Okay? So if you're not bound in a situation where you have to stay with them. If they want to leave, let them. You're not bound. That doesn't mean you're not bound in marriage. You are bound in marriage, as long as that husband is alive. Okay, end of discussion. Okay. Now look at this. I wanted to show this to you. Remember this? There's God and man, they have a covenant. And there's woman and they have a covenant. And then the man and woman get married and they have a covenant. God gave us this relationship of the man and the woman so we could understand this relationship between a man and God and this relationship between the woman and God. It doesn't make any difference, man or woman, in our relationship with God. Remember that? Are we following this one? Let's say she commits adultery. Okay? Now, this is, this is the bad news scenario. She has committed adultery. Cool. What does that mean? She broke the covenant! 
vile, wretched, lousy. She broke the covenant, so now I don't have the covenant between her, right? Okay. If just committing adultery breaks the covenant, then how many times have I broken a, this relationship and broken this covenant because of my adultery? If I go before the Lord on this and I say, okay, if Roxanne goes out and commits adultery and I say, well, that breaks the covenant, so I am free from the covenant, then every time I break the covenant, then Jesus is free from salvation for me. You think about that. You see, it's not because of action. She can commit adultery. That doesn't break our total covenant because I am in covenant with her and I am committed to this and it has nothing to do with her actions. It has to do with my commitment and th her adultery did not break covenant with me because actions didn't make or break the covenant on this one. Do you understand? I'm still committed to her. Because my word said, until death do us part. Ah, oh, her adultery caused death. Don't go there. Not enough. Does that make sense? Folks, listen. This thing is important. God gave us these relationships for a reason. To understand how the things... I am not going to judge her for committing adultery when I know I've committed adultery a hundred thousand times. What's the difference between her adultery and my adultery? None. Where's the grace? Where is God in this? Praise God, my covenant with him is not based on my ability to walk perfectly. Praise God. Also, should my marriage covenant be any different? Folks, healing. First things first. Okay, marriage covenant. Marriage is to show the relationship between Jesus and the church. Moses messed with God's illustration. Why? did Moses not go into the promised land? Anybody know? What did he do? He struck the rock. Instead of what? Speaking to it. Here's the thing. Okay? Here's Moses hanging around in the desert. Boy, why I bring up an illustration, this is going to... Who wants to be the rock? Randall. <laughs> Back into sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the whole crowd sacrificed you, Randall. That's really sad, you know? Okay. <laughs> wow. I still love you, buddy. About healing, <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's Moses walking around through the wilderness, and he says, Lord, they have no water. And God says, Go to the rock and strike it. Boom! So he does. Water comes out of the rock. Later, they're walking along and there is no water and the people are complaining and Moses gets ticked. And he's mad at the people. And God says, speak to the rock. And he goes out, he says, and he tells the people, how long do I have to deal with you people? Do I have to bring water out of the rock for you? And he strikes the rock. Water comes out. And God says, blew it. You'll never see the promised land because of that. Why? Simple. It says in Hebrews that Jesus is the rock that followed them. There was a rock that followed them. There was a rock that was always there for them. Jesus was struck to bring them life in a perfect illustration of he was going to be struck to bring them life. And then all he had to do was be approached and asked. After the striking, all he had to do was ask because you have a relationship and he wasn't asked. Moses blew the illustration by going to Jesus and having him crucified again. Church is over. Yeah. <laughs> so, for the sake of God's illustration, Moses was never able to enter the land. Don't mess with a preacher's illustration. Don't mess with God's illustrations. And now we're sitting here going, and we have the prime illustration of marriage being a relationship between Jesus and the church. And what should we be doing with it? Not messing with it. I'll tell you for a fact. Okay? Don't mess with it. I think that's, that's deep to me. Okay? That's deep to me. It kept him out of the promised land. 
How are we to show grace functions in our life? Man, how are we show, supposed to show to be godly? Can we truly be godly people? Yes, we can. Okay. I'm doing this because I don't want to keep this on a negative note. I've been pushing so hard to get this message done, and it can be so negative feeling. I don't want to be negative. I want to be so positive. Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, and it says, Wives, subject yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord, because a husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. But even as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives to their own husbands in everything. Continual and repeated action, hupotasso, to be under the order of, not less in value, just in position. It's a valuable thing. Is it right? Yes. And I know many people, ah, I don't want to be under him. Why make, he's not better than me. It has nothing to do with better than. There's position. And that's a good thing. And I have found being under people has been a wonderful thing. And I am really one to seek people to be under. I'm not trying to promote myself. It goes on. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up on his behalf. This is the most awesome thing that husbands have, a, have the ability and the call to be the one to express God's love to somebody. To be the priest. To bring all that God is to a person. Man, to love them. God is going to anoint that to happen. Oh. If there's anybody on the planet that's going to love this woman, God is going to use me. Man, I like that. <laughs> and by the way, I do love that woman. <sighs> that he might sanctify it, cleansing it by the washing of the water and the word, that he might present it to himself as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it might be holy and without blemish. The, you know, the longer I live with my wife, the less blemishes she has. You know why? Not because I'm cleansing her. It's just I appreciate her more and more and more. <sighs> what a woman. This is also continuum repeated action. Love and love and then love again. And oh, by the way, don't forget to love. And while you're at it, love your wife. And love your wife. Okay. Cool. goes on. It says, So husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He loving his wife loves himself. For no one hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. This is not a focus on the physical. She comes first even before my own body. How does the Lord nourish and cherish the church? God, it's awesome. Is that what I want to do to her? To spend the time in thinking about her, nourishing her, cherishing her. God, it's awesome. It's so cool. It's not about me. It's about her. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. I am a member of his body, flesh, and bones. Isn't this cool? Found, Randall and I found these in England. Talk about a picture of one flesh. Husband and wife. Shows the wedding rings, doesn't it? Isn't it cool? One person, one flesh. We both, we just went freaky over this. We both bought one, drug these home, clear, made sure they didn't get broken and all the stuff that's happening. This is what our life is to be like. We're one flesh. Man, I love this thing of being one flesh. So cool. <clears throat> these are cold. This is going to take forever. A little hard. Well, that's me. <laughs> boy, girl. Boy, girl. <laughs> cool, huh? Whom God has put together. Boom, smush. Looks like us, didn't it? <laughs> the idea is one flesh, isn't it? To get these to go together, to be welded together, to be one. Cool. Now they're starting to really get there. This is starting to get there. Notice all the pressure it takes to become one flesh. <laughs> it's work. Now it's starting to get better. They're not, it's one ball now, it's not two. Okay. 
Here we go. And we go through some pressures, and we go through some things, we do things in our lives, and I know this, nothing ever happened in your life to bring you into that kind of stuff, so you never, this isn't an illustration for you in any way, shape, or form, right? He said, leave me alone. <laughs> He's a visitor. I can pick on him. Exactly. Three shot, first time. Yeah. Okay. Now things are starting to get a little mixed up. Because the longer I get married, the longer I am married to her, the longer I get married, the longer I'm married to her, the more we start blending with each other. And what is really cool is after a while, even right now, I could give this to somebody, and you know how hard it would be to separate the blue from the red? Almost impossible. Have you ever tried it? Play-Doh, it, doesn't work very good. it just doesn't work very good. What's really cool is the longer you work this, the longer you work it, the more it becomes one color. Parts of this are becoming purple. Folks, this is one flesh. This is the way it's supposed to be. We are becoming who God has called us to be. How cool is that? We are becoming like this. Let's see. Is there any more red inside? Yeah, there's some more red. <laughs> nope. After a while, they become purple. But when you separate... But see, if, if, I, if I separated them now and made two simple ball, what do we got? We got a problem. Because she'll never be able to get rid of you. me. <laughs> you are stuck. <laughs> and you won't get, be able to get rid no, of me. No, never, never will. We always said, divorce is not an option. Murder, however. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Two becoming one. I love it. One flesh. I'm a member of his body, his flesh, and his bones. She's a member of my body, flesh and bone. It's kind of fascinating. That's my body. This one's hers. Okay? According to that first part of chapter 7, 1 Corinthians. That's my body, and this is hers. Even in a divorce. Kind of fascinating. I think I got the better part of the deal. <laughs> okay. If I can't take care of her, I can't do ministry. Because it's home first and then in the church. Then it goes on to say, The mystery is great, but I speak as to Christ and as to the church. However, you also let everyone, each one, love his wife as himself and the wife that she give deference to the husband. This is the second command, to love others as yourself. That was first given to husbands. That's We are the ones to show how to love another. By having a relationship with God and doing for command number one, we are the ones that can do command number two. That word deference is phobeo, phobo, you know, a phobia, fear, actual fear, to be in awe of, reverence, to fear. But you don't fear him, you fear the person, not the person, but the total package. Fearing what could mess up this whole thing. We've got to really be careful with that, okay? Okay. Mellage is a death to independent living. Each one lives for the other. This is not a contract. It's not based on performance, but commitment. Whew. Covenant on every front. I'm going quick here, I know. If we have a strong view on marriage, we will see many healed. <laughs> not to bring bondage or condemnation. That's not what we're for. What is it? But hope and holiness. Actually, bring true hope to somebody. How exciting is that? May God show us how to have compassion. <laughs> In true understanding. True compassion. I will have compassion. Is it going to be easy? I didn't say it's going to be easy. Marriage is not easy. There are more victims than the married couple when it comes to divorce. The true victims are the children. And that's who I fight for. That's who I fight for. What is the message we give to other marriages? <laughs> well, do we want true healing or convenience and justification? We're not in it for convenience. Yeah. 
I hear this in stereo from Kimberly and Miss. <laughs> no, we're not in we're in true healing. Okay. There is no condemnation from me. I just want to bring true hope and understanding to everybody that's about marriage. I just want you to understand. I don't give an easy out. I just want first things first. You hear my heart? I'm not in this thing to try to just be mean. Covenant is the key. Marriage is the teacher. Are we learning yet? I want you to know. I really want you to know. I believe in marriage. I'm so strong on it. This is our 32nd message. 32 messages on covenant. What's the best we can do on covenant? Marriage. But folks, listen. Learn about this marriage so you can learn about this one. Okay? Get this one down and bring it to this one. Oh, and it all works. Okay. Am I still... Everybody happy? No, but do I have to run out? We didn't get the car started, so you're going to beat me up by the time I get there. Okay. Everybody still there? You all okay? Okay. Well, let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, today. I give you praise and glory. I thank you. Lord, I want to see marriages healed. I want to see Christians walking in who you are. I want to see men actually set free from all this junk that hangs on us that we won't deal with. Lord, I just want to see people healed, walking in you, because you're the only one. You are the one. And Lord, for all that, we make sure we give you the glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen.